issues. There are some admin items that we just need to clear out and talk about as well, which we will do. Um, in essence, I hope that you're making good progress so far. I hope that everything is going the way that you're expecting it to and that you're nearly ready for submission. Hopefully most of you have already submitted. I know there are issues with the re weekly retrospective. So we will be creating a new form um, within the next hour or two after class, and we'll be sending that out for those of you who, who haven't completed a retrospective for project two. Prof Kutsia does um, give her apologies. She cannot be here today. She's overseas traveling at the moment. So I am here in the class uh, alone. So please be patient with me. Please bear with me. I can't read the chats and answer the chats while I'm busy presenting. So what I will do is you can still ask your questions in the chat. I will go through the questions after the, the presentation and we can have a discussion about some of those points. All right, so let's start off with the content for today. Um, like I said, we're going to be talking about patterns and standards. So there's a few different things that we want to look at, start to transition our, our mentality and thinking around how we approach solutions, start to lean a little bit more on our systems analysis and design understanding, and then also the very technical details that we've been looking at so far when we've been here in, in this scenario. So just as I'd mentioned, you should be logged into Teams with your student account. Um, this is for the attendance register. So essentially this is going to be how we measure your attendance. You should be busy with project two, nearly finished, possibly even have submitted. Don't forget your reference list, please. Make sure that your, your repository is private on GitHub and you should have at least started looking at project three's brief. There are a few things that we still need to provide for project three, which we'll be doing in the next few days. So please don't stress too much about project three. Please just focus on, on getting your project two polished and, and out of the way. Then also you should be looking at the training. Um, as we've mentioned the last few weeks, your portfolio of evidence is going to be something that you need to continue to update weekly. So please make sure that you're working on that. Make sure that you're doing the training. Make sure that the training that you are doing is going to be valuable. Um, the training that you're going to be doing, make sure that you put it on LinkedIn and that people can see more or less, you know, where you are. And once again, just the guidelines we've provided in the previous classes um, around the training, please make sure you pay special attention to that. Once again, there will be no project deadline extensions, so make sure that your project is in on time. We're not going to be accepting uh, email submissions five, minute late, five minutes late, so please just take special notes of that. All right, then some of the logistics for project two, uh, please make sure that you, you've gone through the submission form. Please make sure that you've, you've at least published or, or submitted before 5 p.m. Make sure that you've gone through your rubric and that you're not going to be losing any marks. Please, please, please double check the pricing of your resources. I know that some of you have already run into the, the challenge where your credits have, have expired. I know Prof Kutsia has been telling the POT students that if your, your credits have expired, you need to create a um, subscription that's linked up to your credit card and make sure that you're using free resources. Please, please, please pay careful attention to this. Make sure that you're setting up your budgets. Make sure you're setting up your alerts so that you don't run into this challenge because we still have another project that we need to use Azure for. Also make sure that your repository has been shared with us. If we don't see your repository, we can't really do anything. We can't really mark. If the, the um, link expires, we will let you know and we'll ask to, to have the link shared with us again or the repository shared with us again. So it won't impact your marks if you didn't share it um, or if it expired. That's, that's the point. If we didn't share it and we couldn't see anything, that's, that's a different story entirely. Then also please make sure your project is updated. So the marks have been released for project one. You can go take a look at those. Um, if you have any queries, please make sure that you use the project mark query form. Uh, check the wiki for the link, please. That is essentially what we're going to be using to, to manage all project queries. All right, so onto today's work. There is a way that we work with architectures. So essentially when we're looking at solution architecture, there are a few things we need to consider. We need to consider what the problem statement is, essentially what we're trying to solve for. We want to understand how we're going to solve it, and we want to understand what the complexities behind that is. And with that comes some form of a selection process. And that selection process essentially determines what you're thinking around the solution architecture is going to be. Now you've learned a lot of things in, in systems analysis and design. Um, one of the very relevant things that you would have learned is process modeling, which I believe is chapter nine in the book that you were using. And essentially that chapter nine talks about how you start off with a very high level conceptual idea or context diagram of what you're trying to solve. Then what you do is you break that up into processes and you create um, decomposition diagrams and work breakdown structures. And essentially you go through the, the whole work of all the steps to make sure that by the end of the, the solution or by the end of the, the process modeling activity, you've got a conceptual understanding or conceptual design of what you're trying to solve for. 
that's a very detailed approach, which is very important because we need to understand what the requirements are of the process that we're trying to, to work with. But essentially, to get there, there are a few things that we need to consider when we're working with technology as well, and we start to move from a conceptual idea to a physical idea, or essentially a physical design. So what we start with is we start with a principle level. This is where we start looking at the architecture style. We start identifying what it is that we want to implement. We start looking at you know, what we're trying to solve. Then we look at the pattern that we're going to use to be solving that pro problem. And that is essentially where the design level comes in. This is how you actually implement the style that you've now selected. Once you've looked at an architecture pattern, you then go to a development level where you start looking at design patterns and principles. And this is how you actually solve the very detailed problems. Now, for those of you who have worked in industry before, or for those of you who have been working on a lot of university projects, there are very specific things that you essentially start looking at when you go from an architecture perspective um, with, a, with a development background. You start to look at architecture from a very technical perspective. You start trying to figure out how you're going to use the logic in your application to solve problems. And that's not necessarily the best place to start. It's, it's what developers are used to, so that's generally where they do start. But what you want to do is actually start from the, the high level. You want to go back to the beginning of the process modeling um, process. And you essentially want to start out with that con context diagram. So essentially, it is a bit of a, a transition. It is a bit of a shift, but this is kind of what, it, what it's supposed to transition from. So where you're looking at your, your very technical details and you're looking at how you're implementing things that would be, you know, from a very development level, if, if that's not, if, if you're not used to thinking about things from a solution architecture perspective, that's essentially where you jump in and you'd find yourself over here. That's not where you want to be. You want to come back over here. So you first want to identify, you know, what it is that you want to solve. You want to understand, is the problem that you're trying to solve an object orientated problem? Do you need to center it around the data that you're using? Do you need to center it around a specific process, in which case you're going to be doing process engineering? What is that style? Once you've selected that style, it kind of determines what choices you have available to you from a design perspective. So for object orientation and for data centered, and even for, for process modeling, you'll have a three-tier architecture that you can apply or a two-tier architecture. Essentially, that's referred to as an N-tier architecture because depending on how you split it up, that would determine how many tiers you have. That three-tier or N-tier architecture is essentially different blocks that, that split out responsibilities in your system. If we're looking at a three-tier architecture, we're looking at presentation, integration, and, and domain logic, essentially, which is a separate tier, and then your third tier would be data. If you're looking at a two-tier architecture, you'd be removing the presentation layer, and you'd only be looking at data, and you'd be looking at logic. So those are some of the examples. You could increase tiers, you could decrease tiers, you could um, kind of create almost like a matrix of tiers to show you know what the design pattern or the, the essentially the architectural pattern should look like but that is that is kind of how the interior architecture is broken down once you've selected your 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 design level architecture pattern you then move over to the design pattern itself which is how you implement the architecture pattern this is now where things become a lot more technical and a lot more detailed if you select a three-tier architecture, let's say in this case we're using MVC with .NET Core, so you've now just developed an API, um, in which case you've used MVC. The only difference is you didn't really have a, a presentation layer, but the MVC can kind of convert it into models, views, and controllers. Now, the repository pattern is what you would apply on top of that MVC pattern to ensure that you're actually getting the most reusability out of your solution. So this is now where you start to tie your entire style and your, your entire architecture selection together. This is now how you start to, to bring things together from an implementation perspective. So there's a few things that we look at when we talk about architecture style. We want to look at the components, we want to look at the connectors, and we want to look at the data. And essentially, this is now where we start to look at how we configure all of these elements within our environment to put together, you know, the way that we want to go forward, because this is going to essentially, like I said, it's going to limit the options that you have going down along the line. When we look at an architectural pattern, we're essentially looking at a templatized approach for architecting solutions. And this is very much where we start looking at reusability. We want to make sure that if we take our entire application or our entire solution and we break everything up into these layers that you see on the screen, we should be able to replace something in any of these layers without having to rebuild the application. So let's say we're building a, a project which has an Excel backend. So all data has been stored on Excel. 
If we decide six months after this has been in production that we no longer want to use Excel and we want to move over to a database, like a SQL Server database, essentially what we want to do is swap out the Excel spreadsheet with a SQL Server database and everything should just work. The rest of the application should work as, it, as it's intended. All we need to do is point it to a different source. That's essentially what you're trying to achieve with an architecture pattern. This is now where MVC is a really good example, as I mentioned, because we now look at these in, in different tiers. We've got them as three very distinct components where the model essentially represents the, the domain data or your business logic. Your view looks at your, your user interface. This is essentially now where you put your HTML and your CSS and all those good things down to actually show you what the, the user is going to be interacting with. And then the controller is essentially what we're going to be using to communicate between the model and the view. So this is what um, the view would be essentially routing to and the controller would be utilizing the representation of the data to actually get the data and map that to user actions. So a model is a very much as it stands there, a model of a table. So if you've got an entity in a database or you've got a spreadsheet or something of that sort, this is going to be what your, your model looks like. So you've got your very defined uh, outcomes of what fields you have in your table essentially. Then you've got your view. Like I said, this is now your front end. So we're looking at HTML, CSS, in some cases, JavaScript. We try to stay away from JavaScript when we're using .NET Core, especially because JavaScript can complicate things a lot. JavaScript is really good, but also you get many different flavors of JavaScript. So you've got vanilla JavaScript, you've got Angular. There's a whole bunch of different types of JavaScript that you can use. And when you're new to JavaScript, it's very easy to confuse all the con concepts and use them together when in actual fact, you're supposed to pick one flavor of JavaScript and stick with it. So that's why we, we haven't introduced JavaScript into this module as yet and why we refrain from using it because a lot of what you're doing with Razor and CSS in .NET Core, you could essentially have replaced with JavaScript, but the, the functionality already exists in the framework. So with that being said, I've also included Razor there. Razor is where you actually now bring some of the C-sharp elements and some of the functionality into your front end. So previously where you would have had to use JavaScript to go get um, information from your database and display that on the front end, you can now use uh, Razor, which is C-sharp syntax to do the same and it would interact with your, your controller and your models in the background. So when you create a view and you scaffold your, your web application very similar to the way that we did it for the web API, the only difference is now you've actually got a front end included. These are the views that would be created with your controller. You have an index, a read, create, write, edit, custom, and delete. When you scaffold this into your controller, you'll see now on the next page, these functions are also scaffolded in. So the view name and the controller method name are very much in correspondence. If they don't correspond, they're not going to, to essentially map correctly. So as I said, the controller is now where we handle all the logic. It brings in the, the definition of the data from the model. It uses your DB context to communicate with your database and all the logic that needs to be built onto the model or use, uses the model is then built into the controller. Once again, they are the methods that you would be using. So what does this actually mean? Because we talk about MVC, which is great, and we understand these different things that we need to do with them, but how does this actually make sense and why is this relevant to us? Why don't we just chuck everything into one controller and use it as such? And I saw there have been quite a few different questions that have come out with Project 2 as well, because I think the, the project in, in itself, the, the context around it is, is somewhat complex because the way that you think about orders and clients and order details and products is in the event that all of that stuff kind of scaffolds in the sense that one customer would have many orders and many orders would have many order details. So how do you kind of break out that that differentiation or that that segregated responsibility? And that's going to be something we talk about when we talk about the standards and the, the principles. But what this actually means for you is that when you're looking at, at MVC, you actually want to have many views or you will have many views because you'll have one view for index, you'll have one view for create, you'll have one view for edit, one for delete, so on and so forth. And those will be linked up to the controller methods. But essentially those different views and those different controller methods would be linked to one specific model. It'll be rendering different outputs from one specific model. So that's essentially what we're talking about before we get to the design pattern. The design pattern is now the next portion of, or the next layer that we put on top of a, an architecture pattern. And this is now where we start looking at standardized ways to actually solve problems technically, so that when we onboard offboard users, when we're trying to solve pro problems consistently, we're doing it very in a very standardized manner in a, and in a manner that can be reused. 
So there are many, many different types of patterns that we can select, but they're grouped up basically into four main categories. There are creational patterns, structural patterns, behavioral patterns, and then the J2EE patterns. Each of these are kind of derived based on the architectural style that you select. So the main differences between them is when you're looking at creational patterns, you're thinking about objects. You're thinking about how you're going to structure the, the data that you're working with or the, the essentially the solution you're trying to build through operators and objects. When you're looking at structural patterns, you're looking at how you're going to compose classes and objects. So essentially creating an object and then creating a class or creating a class and then object of the class and essentially how that inheritance would look. In some cases here, in some of the patterns, you'd introduce abstract and interface classes. But that also depends on, on the pattern that you then select as part of that category. Then we look at behavior, behavioral patterns, which is now where we start to become more concerned with the communication between objects. So if you've got multiple instances of different objects and the objects represent different parts of data, you start to look more at how you optimize the communication between those objects. And then the J2EE patterns is where we speak more specifically around the presentations here. So what the user interface and user experience should look like. That's that's very much used quite in depth with, with Sun Java Center. Um, and it's, it's something that's focused on quite a lot. You'll see more in, in some of the Java type development projects that are used. Okay, so let's look at some of the, the design patterns that we have. So we've broken them up, we've removed J2EE because we're not looking at Java in the semester, but if that is something that you wanted to look at, there are many courses that you can do to understand that better. When we look at the different design patterns, we have creational, structural, and behavioral, as we've mentioned. Creational, we've got something like a singleton method, which is very, very um, basic. It's probably one of the more basic uh, design patterns that you have. And this literally just refers to creating objects, being able to create objects, being able to use objects. You don't have very complex problems when you're trying to use singleton. You're going with a very um, stock standard, very small approach. There's not a very big project that you're going to be doing with singleton. If we look at structural, there's quite a few different things that we have here. Decorator pattern is used quite a lot in Python, especially when you're creating bigger systems and when you're creating Django type web applications with MVT as the, the architecture pattern. So adapter and, and decorator are something that's used quite quite frequently with structural. Remember, structural is where we start to look at the classes and the, the objects. And then the behavioral patterns, we've got a bunch more stuff that, that tends to be used as well. So this is now where we start to look at um, observer pattern. That's also quite commonly used. We've got an interpreter, we've got mediator. Depending on where you end up working and the technology stack that you're working with, Mediator pattern is sometimes used quite a bit in the .NET Core environment, especially when we're doing domain-driven development. So the difference between domain-driven development and test-driven development and data-driven development is that your domain-driven development, essentially you've got very different use cases in terms of functionality that you need to apply. So it makes more sense to kind of break that into a mediator pattern where you can break out that chain of responsibility based on the logic and the different um, types of, of categories of logic that you need to apply. So when we then look at the pattern on the 10, the, the facade pattern, that is pretty much what has evolved into what we know today as the repository pattern. And the repository pattern is something that is used very commonly with .NET Core. If you go do some training on LinkedIn Learning and you go look at Pluralsight and many, many, many other different um, learning platforms for coding, you will see that the repository pattern is one of the most common patterns to use when you're using .NET Core and ASP.NET. So the repository pattern is essentially now where you break this up the same way that you would have done initially with the three tiers, but this now mediates how you move between the domain and the data layers. This is now where you start to create collections and ways to actually um, obfuscate your, your interaction with the data. So what that would look like is broken out here. So you'll have your, your table that comes from the database. Your DB context would represent what your database has in it. The model itself would also be a representation of the table. It would have all the fields that live in that entity, and then we'd have a repository over here. This repository would essentially contain all different functions that you want to perform on your DB context. 
that would then be referenced by your domain logic. So essentially, the, it's this this is now broken out where you initially just had an integration level. You're breaking that into your domain logic and your repository layer. The reason for that is this is because your domain logic, the actual interactions and manipulations of data that you want to make inside of your, your domain logic layer needs to reference your very basic data operations that you have in the repository. So things like create item, delete item, update item, that will all live in your repository and it will link up to your DB context. The reason for this is if this had to change, so let's say we use the JSON file instead of a, a document or instead of a, a database, your repository pattern would then mean that you only replace the data connections over here to look at your JSON. So this essentially is replaced by all of this. Your model still represents your JSON, same table, same structure, everything. It's now just the interaction between them that changes. So from the repository, your repository classes or your repository methods are then accessed and, and called by a domain logic layer, which is then called by your controller, which is then referenced by your view. Now, there are a few principles that you want to look at when you're working with, with design patterns. You want to keep it as simple as possible. If you're not going to need it again, don't use it. Measure twice, cut once. That means that think about the problem you're trying to solve from multiple different perspectives. Some of the things we consider here is performance. What performance impact is your approach going to have? What cost implication, what development timeline implication is it going to have? What overheads is it going to create? Are you creating technical debt? Is there, is there going to be some form of rework that you need to do or something that you need to do extra that you wouldn't have had to do essentially if, if you went with a different approach. Those are the kinds of things that you want to be very sure about when you're when you're putting some development guidelines together. Don't repeat yourself is a big one. Um, here, when we're doing development in larger organizations where we're building many systems, we want to make sure that we're creating as many reusable components as possible. You want to be able to decrease your development time because the more development time you decrease, the more your profit is going to be because the less time you actually have to spend developing things that you've already developed, the less overheads you're going, you are going to have from a performance perspective. You know, if you if you're essentially creating three different versions of the same code and something needs to change, you've got to change all three versions. You've got to change it in all the places that you've replicated and duplicated code instead of just referencing one specific function that does exactly the same thing and changing it in that function, you end up creating spaghetti and you end up creating a mess. So as far as possible, don't repeat yourself. Then there's a, a Occam's razor principle, which says that you need to make the fewest assumptions possible. If there's a place where you've made an assumption about a solution, you need to be able to go back and ask the questions to verify that your assumption is correct especially when you're looking at business requirements. If there's if there's performance requirements and technical assumptions that you're making, some of those can be warranted and can be uh, kind of justified, but it very much depends on, on your thinking around that. The, the rule of thumb is to go with as few assumptions as possible. You also want to go with a big design upfront because when you have a big blueprint, it's easier to execute against. You know more or less what your pitfalls are going to be, and you try to think about as lot of as much of that upfront as possible. Because if you get halfway along the line when you're now developing a new solution and you realize that you've made a, a bit of a mess when you were architecting the solution, you essentially have to go back and redo a significant piece of the work. So the bigger your design is, and the the more comprehensive it is, in theory the less time you're going to waste when you're now busy developing. Then there's also a perspective of avoiding premature optimization. Now, one of the things you would have learned about in systems is the capability maturity model. There is a process that every single solution that you did develop will go through. You will always have the initial phase where you develop something, you put it into production or you get it ready to use. And as it is used, it then becomes more adopted. There are more changes and enhancements that creep in. As those enhancements are applied, your, your, your solution becomes more mature. And with that level of maturity comes certain levels of optimization. And this is really important in the context of, of software development because you can't always create a perfect solution upfront, especially if you're working in agile environments. It's not something that natively happens because the very principle of agile, if you remember from our first class, was that when you execute on agile, you want to deliver value quickly. You don't want to, you know, kind of drag something along and then here at the end deliver everything together. Um, and sometimes when you're trying to, to strive for a perfect solution, you're trying to strive for optimization that goes against the, the delivering quick value um, perspective. 
So that's something that you want to consider. It's good to build solutions with optimization in mind, but it is also realistic to not always be able to achieve that. Then I'm going to skip over eight to nine and I'm going to go to solid because solid is a really big principle for us. It's something that, that should found everything that you do and it's going to be something that is tested extensively in project three. So when we look at solid principles, we're essentially looking at single responsibility principles. So that means that one class should only have one responsibility. You should not be doing multiple things in that class, which is why we break things out into a design pattern to ensure that everything has single responsibility. And when we look at project two, that's essentially what we're trying to achieve with dividing the controllers. So some of the questions that we got was around, do you need an order details controller? And the answer to that is yes, because what happens if you have an ID of an order an order detail, how are you going to be able to, to get the order ID or to get the order details if you don't have a controller to pass the ID to and just get that specific record? What happens when you have to actually pass it through to a different controller and that controller is actually responsible for getting the customer information, but you now need to use that controller to get the order details? That's not single responsibility, that's spaghetti. So you need to, you need to think about what you're trying to achieve with the classes that you're creating. Make sure that they, they are keeping to their single responsibility and make sure that your, your logic that you're building into that is in line with the other principles as well. So the next principle that we have as part of SOLID is open closed, which means that it should be open for extension but closed for modification. You should be able to extend your, your, your solution. You should be able to reuse more of the classes that you've now created, but it does not mean that you should be able to modify them. It doesn't mean that you should give them more responsibility than what they needed. That's why we go with reusable components as far as possible so that you have multiple different functions that you can use and you don't need to modify your, your solution essentially or your reusable components. Then we've got Liskov substitution, um, which is essentially where we're looking at replacing in uh, instances with their subtypes. This is now where we start to look at introducing um, abstracts and interfaces into, the, into the, the solutions because we want to ensure that we're essentially referencing the correct and the accurate versions of the interfaces um, that we're going to be using as part of our, our objects. Then we've got in interfaces or the interface segregation principle. This is now where we look at um, also, once again, the, the way that we in implement interfaces, making sure that clients are not forced to depend on the interfaces that they don't use. And this is where the abstract classes become really relevant because if you remember the, the concepts around polymorphism and the way that you use abstract classes with inheritance. You want to make sure that you have defined exactly what your class needs to be executing just in definition. And then you want to create the class that actually, um, or the interface essentially, that makes sure that that is actually being implemented, which is then inherited by your, your classes and then called through through your objects. Then you want to use dependency inversion, making sure that a program that has an, an interface um, or has an interface, but not an implementation. So once again, those last three are very much related to how you would uh, use your abstract and your, your interface classes. Okay, so there are probably a lot of questions. I'll go through the chat now. I just want to, to chat a little bit about project three before we, we look at some of the questions because I think I might answer some of them here. Um, the first thing that is going to happen with project three is you're going to get an existing code base. This code base is going to be scaffolded by default and you'll see next week's class, we'll do the scaffolding of a solution. You'll see how it works. I'll upload the video to Fundi and you'll see what steps I went through to actually generate the web application. Now what you'll do is you'll fork that repository that'll be made available on GitHub in the week, in the week and you will create your own repository, which you will then use to actually update the code and apply the repository pattern to it. So when you get the web application, it'll already be functional when you receive it. It'll already be connected to a data source. It'll be connected to our data source. So you don't need to stress about your, your database being active. As soon as your project two is marked, you can bring your database down. Please make sure that your database for project two is on the lowest tier. It should be basic. So you should only be incurring, I think something like $5 a month. Um, as soon as project two is marked, you can take that down. Make sure with project three, you've applied principles. So I'm expecting to see solid. I'm expecting to see the, the repository pattern, and I'm expecting to see some of the best practices that you can find from an industry perspective. So go through the forums, troll through some of the, the, the things that people have put down to see what, what best practices are for .NET and .NET Core, and then apply that to, to your solution. 
Then once again, this will be expected to be hosted on cloud. So if your sub subscription has been uh, has expired and you haven't created a new subscription that you've shared with us, you're going to be forfeiting the hosting marks. So please make sure that you come up with a plan on, on how you're going to, to host your solution if your credits have expired. Um, that is a very big thing because we've harped on this quite a lot about making sure that you use your credits wisely on Azure. Um, so please make sure that you, you still keep a, a very close eye on that because it is still required for project three. Then you'll get a rubric, which will also make available in the coming days that you can use to, to understand more or less where you should be. But I think for now, don't stress too much. Just make sure that your project two is, is polished and that you understand the concepts there. The, the nice thing between project two and project three is that project two, if you've, if you've developed your, your controllers and you've been able to scaffold them, you understand the basics for the web application. The only difference between the API or spinning up and scaffolding the web API and scaffolding the, the web app is that the web API has a swagger interface to actually interface with your web app, uh, with your controllers that you've now scaffolded essentially from your models. Whereas with the web application, the only difference is now you've got those those extra views. So you've got the, the index and you've got the create and edit and all that stuff. Um, but once you look at what that HTML looks like and that razor looks like, it'll be somewhat easier to, to implement and understand. Okay, then I'm going to open up for any questions and I'm going to go to the chat and we can see what, what concerns some of you have. And I'll also chat about project two. So for project two, um, one of the questions that was asked was who does, who, who needs to, who should the solution be um, shared with? If you're a POT student, please make sure that you include Prof Kutsia. And then there are two student assistants that you need to include as well. So Lofty Faridi, I'll put that into the chat, and Monet Cruz. So they should be on the rubric as well, and they should also be in the, the form. So when you go through the submission, please just make sure you have their student numbers and you've added them to your Azure subscription. Please make sure that you've added them to the, the repository for your GitHub as well. Okay, then I'm just going all the way back up to the top to go through some of the questions. Okay, so Jacques, I see you're asking, does the retrospective form work for anyone? For me, it says that I've already submitted. Uh, Jacques, just the, an FYI, so we're going to be creating a new form and distributing that, that link. It seems like um, for some reason that that form is not allowing any additional uh, entries, which is weird, so we'll, we'll update that. Yeah, I see some of you couldn't hear me. I don't know if that's changed. Yep, project must be submitted by five o'clock. Um, then there's a question about project one queries. So we're still busy handling the queries. We don't have an ETA. We're still busy looking at them one for one. There were quite a few issues that were encountered. So please be patient with us. We're hoping to get to those later this week. Then there's a question which I don't really understand. Also regarding the readme.md, do we add project one along with project two? I'm not too sure what that means. So for me, you should be creating two separate projects, two separate repositories, one for project one, one for project two. So essentially you, you should have two different readme files. You should just update your project one readme file with what you're doing in project two. Okay. Okay, I see there are people who have heard successfully publish my app. However, the link cre creator takes me to an empty page. Is this normal? It depends on what your, your startup is set up to. So go check your program.cs file, check where it's navigating you to. And then uh, once it's published and you've got the link, maybe just use the Swagger URL to see if you can actually navigate to Swagger and interact with Swagger because you should actually be seeing Swagger. You shouldn't just be seeing a normal URL. So maybe just paste your URL in the chat and we can see if that's correct. Okay, then um, in the project brief, the functionality states using a patch method. However, the rubric mentions a put method. Which one should we implement? Either or. So you can use patch or you can use put. You'll still get your marks. Then if you did it correct, it should show swagger. Yeah. When I execute my code, it shows localhost, but it is connected by the connection string to it. I don't understand. 
Andre Edolf, I don't, I, I see you're saying here when I execute my code, it uses localhost, but it is connected to the um, connection stream when I'm using the Azure database. I'm not sure what your, what your challenge is. So if you maybe just explain to me what you're trying to achieve, are you worried that you can't see your Azure site or are you worried that you're not getting the correct results? Uh, maybe just articulate that for me, please, and I can assist you. Okay, and then there's a question from Neo. Excuse me, Prof. When I did my GitHub versioning on VS22, I published or pushed and committed my files and program to a master branch instead of the main branch. Yeah, we should still be able to see it. Master branch, main branch is the same thing. Um, just make sure when you submit that you give us the correct uh, URL to the correct branch, please. Okay, how do you solve this error when publishing publish has encountered an error? Be sure that the startup CS um, the application is calling add swagger from within convict services in order to generate swagger. Okay, so what you need to do there is you actually need to add the add swagger gen inside of your convict services, which is in your program.cs. So the add swagger gen uh, is a it is a function that is, I'm just trying to think, I think it's part of the options builder that you can use when you're configuring your services in the, the web API. Um, that essentially is what you're going to be using to tell your your back end that it needs to be integrated with Swagger and that you're going to use it from the front end. So please just keep an eye on that. I'm pretty sure if you chuck that that into Google or into ChatGPT, it'll give you the, the code that you just need to add. Just make sure that you reference what um, version of .NET you're using because it differs from .NET Core 3.1 to .NET 6. If you're using .NET 5, or, uh, no, I lie. If you're using .NET 6, you only have a program.cs file. If you're using ASP.NET Core 3.1 or ASP.NET 5, you've got startup and, pro and program.cs. So just keep an eye on that, please, because that is going to impact the way that this works. Okay, I'm getting this error 500.30 ASP Core failed to start. Just check, um, it is possible that your credits have run out or if you delete your app service and you republish, check if that works. Where are the marks published? They are published on Gradebook and on Dropbox. Your rubric should be up on Dropbox. So if your app service is stopped, I can't mark it. Remember, your app service should be free. So if it is running or whether it is not running, it's, it's going to not incur any costs because um, you should not be getting any costs. It should be on the free tier. Please make sure that it is on the free tier. If it is accumulating costs, then you've got a problem. You've incorrectly configured it. If your database is the one that's incurring costs, make sure it's on the basic tier because then it should be incurring a lot less costs. Um, but if it's stopped, we can't mark it. So please just keep an eye on that. How long does it take to get your project mark query feedback? We're still busy looking at the project mark uh, feedback. Please just be patient with us. I have mentioned that. There's no link for retrospective project two. It's the same one as project one, but we're going to send that out again. Yeah, I see a lot of you have answered some of the questions here. If you want to query your marks, please do so in the form so that we can help you. It's a little bit difficult when you make comments like for those of us who made our Kanban project private when submitting, I would like to understand why we are getting penalized. So please just, if you have issues, please just pass it through the form. We'll look at it. Um, for those of you on Potch on Tuesdays, I will speak to Prof Kutsia to see what we can do about access to the labs. Yes, we're creating inf interfaces next. Um, there will be three tiers in the next project that you can choose to implement. So based on your level of, um, I want to say enthusiasm for where you think you can kind of fit in the concepts that you're learning here, there will be an opportunity for you to look at different ways of implementing this. So for those of you who want to challenge yourself, you can go to the extreme and actually go do this in different projects. For those of you who just want to kind of get by it and just understand the concepts and show that you can um, apply them, you can use your generic repository and the interfaces, which you'll get marks for. And then the first tier would be for those of you who just want to apply the repository classes. Obviously, there will be different marks associated to the different tiers, but you will still pass if you if you choose to do tier one. So just take a look at that. Okay, then just checking here what hasn't been answered. 
Okay, I see there is a, a thing here for we need a physical class. Um, I'm not sure if that's referring to the POTCH or the VOL students. I'm not sure what you're hoping to get out of that class. So please just let me know what your expectations are and we can manage that. Okay, I see there's a lot of questions about security, but nobody's really articulating what's, what those issues are. So please, please clarify that and I can help you. I'm still just going through the chats. Please just give me a second. I don't know why we're looking at three to three context here, guys. This is an, an entirely different class. I don't know. This is not the forum to be discussing other modules. Please, please use this forum adequately. Okay, here's a good question from Ruan. Uh, my Azure does not allow connection from any public IP address. I have allowed a certain IP range from my local address with the markers add their own IP addresses. We can give you our IP addresses. Usually what we do when we put um, public IP addresses down is we make the entire range available from 0000 to 255255255255. Um, so you can either do it that way around or if you want us to add it individually, please make sure we have the adequate access to do that, in which case we're going to need admin access and not contributor access. That is a very important point because if we can't access your database, we can't mark your project. Okay, then for project three, um, I think it might still have some work from last year. Yeah, so we just need to double check that. That's why I'm saying we'll make sure all of that stuff is available. Are we allowed to implement unit of work and interfaces for repository classes? Yes, you are. So that'll count parts of tier three as the implementation. You're welcome to do that. Okay, I'm still not understanding what you're asking for, Elo. Okay, so um, Ale Brinkman, you're asking about the type of authentication that was implemented. So for those of you who decided to do security and add security as an option, there are multiple different types of security you can implement. You can have token kind of security, you can have username, password, you can have no security. We just want to understand what you used, if you used anything and provide us with the relevant details. Yes, project two should have a separate readme. Albert, you have up until end of next week to finalize any project queries. Um, we are still looking at the project queries, so they are still open. We will send out an announcement when they close or when the, the deadline is approaching. Faith, I see your request for us to please accept the invites for collaborations and answer our emails. Um, so just something I'd like for you guys to bear in mind, please. There are over 270 students. So for each of you who send a GitHub invite, we have to go accept each of those manually. So what I do on my side, Prof Kutsi has a different system, but what I, what I do on my side is I have an automated system that goes through once every few days and goes and accepts all of the, the requests. So if your request hasn't been accepted yet, please give it until the end of the week. We have seven days to accept it before it expires. So those invites will be accepted and we'll make sure that you don't get penalized if they aren't, if they, if they expire. As for the emails, please bear with us. There are a lot of emails coming through because students aren't using the project marks 
query form. They're sending them to us individually. So trying to sort through that is a nightmare at the moment. So for those of you who aren't using the form, you can see that your peers aren't very happy with us because we're neglecting them and this is the reason why. So please, we've made that form available, please use it. Then there's a few things here around the credentials. Um, please make sure that the credentials that we that we need to be able to get into your system is there. If you haven't shared your Azure database with us or your Azure resources with us, we can't access those. Um, giving us a username and password isn't really necessarily going to help us there. The credentials we're asking for is to actually use your API. So we need to test that your API works. And to do that, if you've implemented some form of security with a username and password or a token, we need that information to be able to test. Okay. Yeah, so once you've completed the retrospective form and you've already submitted your project, please make sure that you just select yes. Okay, so you've created a, a folder within project one for project two. I don't think that's going to work out for you quite nicely. Um, if that's your approach, um, just it, look, it depends on what you put down for your project one. If you're going to do all of the projects in the same repository for the entire semester, then that's fine. If you've done them in different branches, please just access or give us access to those different branches. Um, you wouldn't necessarily get penalized for as long as we can actually access your solution and test that it works. Yeah, so I'm also worried that you're using the local site and not Azure um, because we're going to be marking off of Azure. So to test your, that everything's working locally, that's perfectly fine to use localhost. Please just also test Azure once you've published the B so that you can see what we're going to see when we mark. I just want to confirm for the POE, um, are we supposed to do it ourselves or are there things that we should submit through? Okay, so if you submit through the forms, there are a few things, Jacques, that um, will be submitted through the forms that we're going to make up on the POE. So we're going to pre-populate a lot of that for you. And essentially what will then happen is you'll get access to what that document is and include any other blanks that we may have missed. And then you can submit that. Then should we add reference to this to the readme file or upload it as a separate both, please? Please add it as a separate file and just copy and paste it into your README file. Okay, if we need a remark for project one, do we update project with our progress? Yes, so you can update the projects. If you need a remark, just pass us through the, the project query. We'll mark from there. Okay, once again, guys, I don't know what errors you're talking about, so please be a little bit more specific. I get this message when clicking on the retrospective. Yep, have already spoken about the retrospective. Okay, so if you stored the connection string with a password in the app settings.json file, that's perfectly fine. If you use Key Vault, that's also perfectly fine. Both options are good. If you've used Key Vault, please just make reference to it because that is something that you would probably get a bonus mark for. Um, because that is something that you should have put inside of your, your readme file from the last project as well. Um, it is a very secure way of doing things. If you use the app settings.json file, please just make sure that there's no reference to your DB in the DB context, because I will subtract marks if you've, if you've got an app settings.json file, but you're still referencing your DB, referencing the database in your DB context. Okay, um, this is your URL. Yeah, so this URL, let me just check who sent this, PT Mota. Um, this URL doesn't have the swagger endpoint at the back. So if you add API forward slash, or oh, I think it's API forward slash swagger.index, um, you should be able to, or swagger.html, just check the, the swagger URL. But if you add that to the back of this URL, you'd be able to, to access your swagger. So it should be okay. Okay, so I see you can't find Monet. I'll just give you the student number, then you can add him. Okay, um, I see there's a question here about uh, not understanding why the Azure resources have been depleted. Um, so maybe just pop us a mail so we can assist you with that, please. I think I've already answered what happens when there is an expiry. If you've missed that, please just go back into the recording and listen to it. Your project will be marked if it doesn't work correctly on Azure, but if it doesn't work correctly and I can't get the results, sorry guys. 
I'm not sure what you want me to do. If I can't run it on the local and I can't replicate your results, it's difficult for me to mark what you're doing. Um, I will also look at the code. So it's not just that I'm expecting the solution to just magically work. I will go through the code as well and try to figure out why it didn't. But they are, they, you are still going to lose marks if it doesn't work correctly, because obviously that means something went awire. Okay, thank you very much for re-inviting us. You can update your project. Yeah, guys, I see you're impatient. Hey, can you can you just can you give us some grace here, please? Okay, I see some of you have already started answering. Thank you very much for those of you who are assisting with the answering of questions. Really appreciate it. Uh, the Swagger index.html, you should add that to your URL, not to the code. Guys, if you have queries about project one, please use the form and we can discuss it by email. Um, you can use Jackie M guest. I think I'm added to the tenant, but please use my email address, uh, the 2605-8995 email address. If you type in Jackie Miller, you should see it pop up. No, please don't provide uh, passwords in the README, provide it through the form, because remember, if you make that README public, everybody's going to be able to access it. Um, Melissa, I see that your API works, but it seems that the API doesn't work so nicely when it's in Azure. Just check your IP address range. It could be an IP address issue where you haven't added the full public range. So 0.0.0.0 to 255.255.255.255. That would be one of the reasons why it wouldn't work. Yeah, you can add everyone in the resource group if you want. Um, just make sure that you're not adding your uh, classmates, just make sure you're adding the lecturers and the student assistants, please, Jacques. You can add us to the resource group, it's fine. Okay, Dean is saying, ma'am, I can execute my controllers through local when I try execute on the website. Yep, same thing, maybe try the, the, the IP address range. Yeah, you can submit another request um, for project two after you've submitted the first one. We'll take the last one. Okay, yeah, I've, I've repeated the public versus I, uh, private IP. Um, in project two submission link, there's no place to submit link for your IP or your uh, It should be there, I'll double check. Yeah, you can leave. Sorry, I'm only seeing now that you don't. If you don't have questions, you're more than welcome to drop off. <laughs> After this submission, I think I'm ready for industry. <laughs> okay, let's get through project three and four first, then we'll talk again. But yeah, it's it's one step closer. How do we Harvard reference um, ChatGPT? So it's actually quite interesting. You should uh, try ask ChatGPT how would Harvard reference itself. It's actually quite interesting the answer you'd get. So take a look at that. I think you'll be quite um, entertained. Okay, Najma, I see you've you've pasted your same error again. Um, it's difficult to debug this without understanding where things went wrong. So, like I'd mentioned earlier, 
maybe see if you can create another free app service. Try publish to that and see if it works. If you're still getting an internal service error, then you're going to have to debug because it seems like you need to clean and build your solution again. It might be that. No, you can use uh, US East. It's fine if it's a cheaper cost. You shouldn't be getting any costs actually, but if it is cheaper, that's fine. It's just your latency is going to be a, a whole thing. Okay, so the role assignments from contributor to admin, if you're going to I, IAM, you can change the role contributor there and just add us as admins. So if it works locally and I can't test it on Azure, yes, you're going to lose marks. If it works partially on Azure, um, essentially the code that you submit is going to be what we mark. So that's that's the best answer I can give you. Guys, I'm not going to repeat what's happening. Um, please go back and watch the recording. How do you reference YouTube videos, Jandre? Um, there is a nice referencing guide on the library website, which shows how to reference um, videos and online resources. This goes for everybody, not just Jandre, because I know that he's asking the question, but a few of you have the, the same questions. Um, so there is a specific format you have to reference the video, you have to reference the publisher, which is then YouTube, you have to say the date last referenced, and you have to provide um, just the name, which in this case would be YouTube as the publisher, there wouldn't be an author. If there is an author name attached and it's not a company or some weird entity, you can add that in as well. Okay, I've already mentioned the student's assistance for all students, um, you can just add me if it's the Hot students, um, Monet and Lofty also need to be added. Yeah, so these these auto these auto generated uh, methods are sufficient, but remember the rubric also says that there are additional ones that need to be implemented as well. So those are fine, you can use those, but please also add the additional um, logic or functionality that is that is requested. Okay, ma'am, do we only need to add you? Yep. Yep. Yes. So the last question, Ale Brinkman, if you used um, user auth or API token, it's fine. Um, you'll still get the marks for that. Okay, guys, we're on the dot, so I'm going to end the class off. If you have any other questions, please feel free to pop them through and we can answer them there. Thank you so much for attending class. Have a lovely one further.